Good evening and welcome to the Barbican Theatre. My name is Laura Kriefman and I'm the CEO here. I'm really excited to be here this evening with you uh, for one of our Rebels Masterclasses. Um, you're in for an absolute treat tonight because we have the fabulous Lyndon Campbell with us here who hopefully will turn on her um, camera and wave at you as I introduce um, this evening. A um, couple of little bits of housekeeping. Um, this is in a webinar format here on Zoom, which means we can't see you guys at all. So we just know you're here and we're very happy. Um, if you have any questions, use the Q&A function and or the chat function as well to just feedback anything you want to whilst we're going on um, uh, throughout uh, this webinar. Um, we've of course got a whole series of these as you guys mostly know so um, we've got uh, Tim Norman next week who's a really great stage manager talking through all the new nuances of what stage management is what the different roles actually are what how it actually works when you're out on tour all of that lovely stuff and then after half term we'll be back with um, a huge another bumper series as part of a joint program with uh, Plymouth University and Plymouth College of Arts um, so do stay tuned and um, we're going to keep them online to the end of this term uh, just because everything's changing and then hopefully from next September we're going to be able to be back face to face with you all which will be marvellous. Um, Lyndon, let me introduce Lyndon to you. Lyndon is um, uh, one of the women I'm most in awe of. I think she's extraordinary. I met her because I was uh, lucky enough to be part of a program called Key Change which was about tackling uh, gender parity in the music industry. And um, Lyndon was also one of the innovators picked up from the UK to be part of this programme. Lyndon is the head of synchronisation at Domino Records and Domino's Publishing. Um, and she's our guest expert with us speak, and who's gonna kind of like uh, talk us through lots of things about demystifying licensing music for content creators and how to make money from your own music without being signed to a big label. Um, her career, she started at EMI Records, she has worked for every, you know, um, licensing music from across the board, um, including artists like Kate Bush and Blondie and Queen and Nick Cave and Beach Boys. Um, she has worked on um, uh, massive TV campaigns and films like Children of Men and in 2009, she joined Domino uh, record, Recording and Publishing Companies to establish a brand new proactive synchronization service outside of the US. Um, I'm really, we're really lucky to have Lyndon with us today, and I'm really looking forward to hearing all of her wisdom. As always, if you have any questions, anything you want to pick up on, throw it into the chat, throw it into the Q&A, and we, I will do my best to make sure um, we answer any questions you have. That's all for me. I'm going to turn my video off for a bit and introduce and hand over to the fabulous Lyndon. Hello. Hey, here I am by magic, the magic of Zoom. Um, <laughs> thank you very much, Laura, for a very kind introduction. Um, so I'm here today to give some tough love and uh, real life sharing of knowledge to anyone who is a music maker or a creator of content. Um, I am aware that we are in a state of change and uncertainty, um, but the music industry has always been in a, state, in a state of change and uncertainty. So we have to ride the crest of that wave. So I'm going to ride the Zoom sharing wave and attempt to share with you my fantastic Zoom presentation. So today, in half an hour, I am going to demystify music licensing and tell you how to make money from your music. So um, I'm just going to quickly whiz through my plan is to tell you who I am, what do I do? Go into the production workflow of uh, putting music into film, TV, ads and games. Um, I'm going to talk about digital opportunities. I'm going to talk about how these rules of work can apply to you as a freelance creator. And I'm going to go into some technical licensing process, which I will try to do as painlessly as I possibly can. So who am I and what is Domino? So I work at Domino Records and Publishing. We are a independent, fully independent uh, music company. We look after songwriters, 
and we look after recorded artists. So we put records out for some people and for other people, we look after their notes and their lyrics. We're a boutique music publishing company. Head over to our uh, website, dormanthepublishingco.com and get lost in there. There's loads to find. You can see our roster. You can see the work that we've been up to and you can find out what we do. What the heck is synchronization? So music licensing is, uh, comes in many forms. You might be licensing music to streaming platforms. You might be licensing samples for other artists to use snippets of your song in their, uh, in their own recording. Um, and today I'm just gonna be talking about something that's called synchronization. It's a very long word. It's a silly word. It's a music industry construct but it means putting music onto visual content. So day to day, it means that I speak to people who create adverts, branded content, films for Instagram, Netflix shows, Amazon TV shows, games, all sorts of different things that involve visual content. And we negotiate the rights. And that means we charge people money to put, their, put our music onto their visual content um, and it's it's kind of complex but also kind of straightforward as well but I'll you you can decide if it is complex or not but I really hope that by the end of this you'll realize that you don't need to be signed to a record label you just need to be just need to use your brain a little bit and maybe get a good lawyer I also really strongly recommend that you head over to the Association of Independent Music, fantastic organization in the UK set up to support independent music makers. They uh, offer a huge amount of advice around sync to their membership and they uh, host a event, an event every year with the Guild of Music Supervisors. Um, and I've put their web links here and I urge you to go and check those societies out. I think they'll give you a lot of help and advice. Um, AIM uh, release a kind of overview of SYNC every year with loads of advice, tips and updates on what the latest trends are. Um, they said that in 2019, uh, the synchronization income was about 28 million pounds. They said there was 11% growth and uh, what I would read from this is that there's some money to be made by some people, but only for the people who understand how it works. And so I'm going to go and tell you how it works. So when do we license music to a film? So if we just think about a film or a TV show, even a game, um, it all starts when they start writing the script. And so it might be that they actually put the lyrics or they might refer to a band in the script of a book or in the, uh, the script of a computer game. So if you're the sort of person who likes reading books, you might be reading a book like The Power, which is just about to be made into a film. It might have some musical references. And if you become one of those musical references, that's when the game of licensing starts. Uh, it's not always possible to get your music written into the script or the book. Um, and so what I do as a synchronization person licensing music is I make sure that I speak to people as far in advance as I possibly can. So when we talk about pre-production, what we're talking about is all the stuff that goes on before people set up the cameras and start filming something. So it may be that there's a scene in a film where they're listening to a radio and it might be that you want to get your song into that feature juice quite early on. And so people like me are expert at finding those kinds of scenes and getting in the head of the game to try and make sure that if, when they put that radio, uh, car radio on in the scene, which is actually in the audio of that scene, that it's got our music on. Another thing might be that we um, try and inspire the directors and writers that work on films and see if we can get them to use our music as source material for some of the inspirations of their scenes. Moving into production, which is when they've got the cameras set up and they start filming, 
Um, I've just mentioned the feature use might maybe getting something into like the car radio plays in the background, but you can often get opportunities like having your music um, being choreographed to. So you might have people dancing to the music um, and all of these usages need different kinds of permissions or just a different level of awareness and they could affect the fee. We'll come back to that. Um, Post-production, which is when most of the music licensing happens, is when you have often have music supervisors, editors and producers sitting in an editing suite and cutting music to the background of a film or TV show or a game. Um, at that stage, we're often looking for particular mixes, instrumentals and stems. So we're looking at the audio parts and we're trying to fit your music in and around the voiceover and the sound effects in the scene. And lastly, uh, the distributor. So uh, you have production companies that make the TV shows, films and games, and then you have distributors who put them out. And the most famous one at the moment is probably Netflix. So a Netflix show isn't always made by Netflix, but sometimes it is. But in the majority of cases, Netflix is like Sky, the BBC, it's a broadcaster. And those parties might want to put music on trailers. Um, they might also have particular arrangements and agreements that you have to sign with them because they're quite big. So um, there's lots of different stages where music gets licensed to film, TV and games. And who do we speak to? We speak to the writers, directors and producers, the editors who are sitting in the post-production suite cutting the music to picture. We speak to music supervisors who are basically specialist brokers that negotiate deals and know all of us lot who own the recording rights or the publishing rights. We deal with ad agencies, brand marketeers, and a lot of lawyers sometimes. There's also games developers and a multitude of other people. And um, really all synchronization is if you're getting proactive is getting out and about and meeting these kinds of people, making sure they've got your music. It's all about relationships. So I want to talk about the digital world and metaverses, but I'm going to keep it simple. Online has made life amazing. It's democratized music. More people can access your music. And the offshot shot of this is that when you put something on Spotify, Domino puts something on Spotify, we're all competing against each other. And it's slightly killed the notion of the big sync. So the platforms that we license to now are global, they're online, and it's not the same kind of universe that we used to understand where we used to have TV channels and broadcasters that ruled the roost. It's now pretty much a free for all, and that's an opportunity and a threat. So the opportunity is more opportunities for a wider range of music on a wider range of programming, on a wider range of channels. The threat is, unfortunately, a lot of these channels are owned by kind of very big companies and the fees for each use have slightly shrunk. But there are more channels and there are potentially more opportunities for a wider range of music. So all is not lost. So I thought it might be fun to have a look at some examples and I'm going to stop sharing my uh, keynote and I'm now going to shimmy over hopefully to Google and with the power of Zoom, I'm gonna share my work. So I'm hoping that you can all see our website. So in here, I've put a load of work that we've done and you're very welcome to have a little look through. Uh, you can click on um, some of the things we've done. So here's a Formula E job that we just did and you can see who worked on it, who we worked with. There's a producer called Uncommon, which is an ad agency, what happened and what song we used. So in this particular one, uh, we had John Hopkins and a track called Singularity. So I thought what would be quite nice is to show you a few of the things that we've done. And I'll just kind of like, um, I'll, I'll let you watch these and then we'll go into the nuts and bolts of how we got these songs into these shows. So the first thing I'd like to show you is actually for a brand called Van Moof. 
and Bam Moof is a electric bike company. They came to us asking for a, a cool, soulful track that uh, they could place on their online content film. So we sent them some suggestions. My colleague Will sent them the song, uh, Let's Get Together. They liked the song, they cut it to picture, and hopefully when I press play, you'll be able to watch the outcome. So you might get a bit of a running theme with some of these films because I have a personal ambition to try and do as many electric, sustainable adverts and content pieces as we can. But you'll find there's a lot of opportunities now to license films to uh, online content. So when you're watching YouTube, an advert will pop up for like 20 seconds. And so what we're having to do is find songs that will fit 20 seconds or less on an advert. So you're now licensing between five to 20 seconds of a song to an online branded content film. So if your music doesn't really edit down very well to five or 10 seconds, it can be difficult to find opportunities, but equally um, it's just about having a different perspective of your music because there's a lot of companies out there that are really keen to license songs for their online content films. The next one I'm gonna play is actually a fashion film and it is featuring uh, a song by Ella Minus. A lot of opportunities for online fashion content. And Ella Minus, uh, her song was used, I think, it, towards the end of this uh, Chanel um, campaign. And it was uh, licensed to a, um, a music supervisor in Paris. So we're working internationally all the time. And um, they are big fans of her music. They contacted us to use the song. And the turnaround for these sorts of usages are quite quick. Um, it's literally a catwalk. And the most exciting thing that's going on at the moment is how fashion is embracing um, the internet and how they're being, becoming quite innovative around their online content. So I'm just gonna quickly play the audio. <laughs> Gosh, that didn't work. We have lots of opportunities all the time. We're constantly scouting for different uh, things that we can do with our music. And one of the other things that we also do, I'm just trying to share my screen and it's misbehaving, is um, we uh, license music through what's known as a blanket agreement to the BBC. And sometimes um, the broadcasters in Europe don't need to contact us directly. They're already able to use music under the agreements that they have with their uh, collection societies. I'll go into that in, in a minute. And here is a um, piece that we did with uh, Anna Calvi for Peaky Blinders. What is God and that are the Peaky Blinders? on the ropes. Who's gonna hang us now, eh? Wake up slowly Mr. Shelby, 
you've come to my attention. No one is going to hang you, Tommy. You're going to hang yourself. We all try and get away. So the most exciting thing about Peaky Blinders season five is that we actually scored the um, soundtrack as well as having music placed in the show under the blanket agreement. And to do that, we have to negotiate a deal, agree a license, and also make sure that the artist knows what they need to do and how they need to make music. The most exciting thing about Sync is that it doesn't scrutinize whether you're on a major label, a publishing company signed or not. Uh, there are a lot of words that people use to describe music, emerging, um, uh, unsigned, all this sort of thing. Provided that you're registered with the PRS and MCPS and PPL, your music can be used by any broadcaster and there's absolutely no reason why they can't find your music on Spotify, contact you through your website to get the um, downloadable files and place your music in a TV show. If the music's good, they can find you, you'll find your music will go in shows like Made in Chelsea and all sorts of different trailers that are used by the major broadcasters in the UK. Um, I'm now going to play a couple of uh, branded pieces. Um, we just did a piece today with John Hopkins and um, it celebrates uh, 200 years of The Guardian. Think of those that marched this road before and those that will march here in years to come. History is watching us and what will we become? So that film is one that anyone could really be part of. It's just a case of um, being available and um, knowing the producer, knowing the editor at The Guardian, if you're already speaking to the press, because they needed um, some music um, uh, at a fair level of fee, may I say, to promote their um, 200 years. And so all of the things that I've shown you today slightly with the exception of maybe doing a score are pretty much available to anyone who is making music um, and I might play you another piece that we did uh, recently at the end of this just to show you but now I want to go and tell you how the heck it all works so I'm going to head back to my um, my presentation um, so we have kind of uh, stripped music licensing down to five steps. So we're gonna get technical with you now. And I am gonna go through this quite quickly. So hopefully you can play this back. Um, steps are effectively ownership, asking questions, negotiating the terms, processing the request, which is getting approval, which you don't have to do if you're already the artist, and then um, getting paid raising the invoice. So rights is, it's all about ownership and the statutes of every country in the world pretty much dictate that music is a legitimate copyright. And that means that you can buy and sell it. And it's wonderful because you don't need to have a stinky factory. You don't need to dig a mine. You don't need to hire anyone other than yourself. As soon as you write a song, the lyrics and the composition, the uh, statute law in the UK makes that a property that you can buy and sell. And when you lay down a recording, that also creates another entity that you can buy and sell. And music licensing is basically finding out who owns what and then contacting those people for permission in return for a fee and making sure that you have 100% of the publishing rights and 100% of the recording rights. So if we look at Domino, Domino Records, which is on the left, um, Domino Records looks after lots of different imprints and uh, it owns the sound recordings to uh, music that's released on those uh, imprints. So 
we just played uh, John Hopkins. He is on Domino Records, and so we'd be licensing the sound recording. Domino Publishing look after lots of different catalogues, including uh, Relapse, which is a metal label from Philadelphia, heavy music, it's also got some sci-fi and Norwegian uh, folk inspired music as well, if you want that. We have Analog Africa, which is a catalog of African music from the 80s, psych, folk, punk, whatever you want, we got it. We have lots of different rights. We look after the notation and the lyrics of songs. So as a publisher, we're looking after the notes and the lyrics. And as a record label, we're looking after the sound that you can hear what used to be put on a tape. So always, always, always remember there are always two sides to every track. If you own your own music and you recorded it yourself and you wrote the notes and you wrote the lyrics, you are due two fees, two licenses for the use of your music. So at Domino Records, any sound that's recorded by an artist that's controlled by us, so the artist, they originally own the sound recording, but they sell the rights to us. And then that means that we own those rights. We often refer to this as the master side or the recording side. And the collection society that looks after the record labels is called PPL and they collect money. So if my song by Anna Calvi is played on Peaky Blinders, PPL already have an arrangement and the money is paid through PPL uh, between BBC and PPL. On the publishing side, it's the lyric and compositions that are created by songwriters that we control. This is referred to as the publishing side. So two sides and the PRS look after the uh, collections. So if Anna's music is played on Peaky, we own that music. We own the notation and the composition and lyrics that gets uh, collected by PRS. If the use is not covered by PPL or PRS blanket agreement, then we actually do a direct license and we negotiate the fees directly with the person to whom we're giving permission. So that might be the producers of Peaky, which would be Endemol or Tiger Aspect. Also remember that if you want your music used on the television in the UK, you need to be a member of PRS and MCPS. So just going through this very quickly, but we have a process of describing our music by sides. So at Domino, we look after both sides to villages. We look after a bit of the publishing for Georgia. Um, she has a co-writer, so she shares her publishing rights. Um, but we look after the recording rights. So there's, there's splits. Um, we only look after the publishing rights for Fontaine's DC. Partisan look after their recording rights. And for Domino Records, um, Strange Weather that I played on Peaky, uh, that's actually only a recording right because the publishing that we normally own for Anna doesn't apply because it was a song written by an artist called Karen Ann. And how do you find all this out? If you go on Spotify or Discogs, you find uh, what we call label copy, and that, that determines what the sound recording rights are. To know who looks after the publishing, you have to go on PRS database, which all sounds very fussy and complicated. And that's great because that has created an industry called synchronization, and that's what I do for a living. So music supervisors are specialists in hunting out those rights and contacting people like me to get permission. This is what the PRS system looks like. And so here I've got a, a snippet of Anna Calva, Calvi, Rider to the Sea. And you can see that it just says Domino Publishing. And I've put in here Shaka Khan Like Sugar. And you can see there are a lot of different writers and a lot of different publishers. So what does this all mean? I think it means for a freelance composer or creator of music that you can simplify the music rights. And when someone contacts you, you know what you own. Be careful if you're covering somebody else's song because that publishing will be owned by somebody else. And it might be owned 
by one or more publishers. So step two. Step two in licensing is basically asking questions. Find out when someone needs music cleared by. Maybe set up your own license request form, which makes your negotiations more accurate and speeds up the process. Never just say, yeah, that's fine, because you desperately want a sync and you want it on the telly. Make sure you find out what the full terms are first. Make sure that you own your own song. You own the, the two sides or one side. If you don't own the sides, that you make sure that that party that's interested in your music knows who they need to contact. Always feel free to ask questions. Never assume anything. With film and TV, it's, if it's not been made yet, so it's in pre-production or production stage, it's not been finished, it's not in post-production, always, always, always ask to see the script, ask to know what, who the director is, ask who the cast is, ask if there's anything that you feel uncomfortable with. So if you're vegan and you don't want your music associated with anything to do with meat products, ask that question. It's absolutely reasonable and there shouldn't be any reason why anyone wouldn't respond if someone isn't responding and giving you the information that you need like as simple as what brand is is it that you want to license my music to then it's probably not going to be a good deal to do always charge a fee even if it's 50 quid always 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 ask for money value yourself you are important and if they weren't asking you to do the music they would have to instruct or hire somebody to create the music even music libraries which are facilitated to try and make music easy for filmmakers they charge for their they charge for the use of their music so you should do the same too and if you're not sure how much to charge then think about at the end of the process you might have to raise uh, an agreement and that means a lawyer so how much will it cost you to hire a lawyer so if you think it might cost you 75 pounds charge 100 pounds if you think it might cost you 250 pounds charge 500 pounds um, think about how much it costs you to hire a studio for, to, uh, for a day and and that's a good starting point if you're not very sure what to charge obviously you can always have conversations with people in the pub and they'll tell you i made five thousand pounds fifty thousand pounds a million pounds for licensing music to um to a film tv show or an advert you just have to be sensible and take everything one step at a time on a case by case basis, but just make sure that you own the rights. When we were negotiating the deal, which is the money, as I say, fees are negotiated on a case by case basis. We try to negotiate fees based on what the client needs, not what the client wants. So we ask lots of questions to make sure that they're not asking for all media worldwide in perpetuity when all they really need is two weeks online social media ask sensible questions what's the total production budget that gives you a range of how much to charge so if the total production budget is one million pounds then maybe it seems reasonable to charge up to a thousand pounds for the use of your music look at the term the territory and the media that's required we look at the nature of the use so when we're asking questions we're basically wanting to find out exactly what song they're interested in. We want to see short synopsis, notable actors. If they've got a famous actor, then it kind of implies they might have some budget or maybe they're doing something for a charity. Maybe you want to check it is a real charity and a registered charity. You can ask about the usage. Is there anything going on in the scene that you feel uncomfortable with? Is there violence? Is there anything that you feel conflicts with your uh, ideology or maybe you're not bothered about that but you just want to make sure that it it doesn't it's not a scene that's going to embarrass you or diminish your own um kind of personality that you're trying to the profile you're trying to build around yourself we ask about the media we ask about the territory and the term because it helps us scope out sort of what fee we should be charging for the use so if it's all the media in the world you might expect the the fee to be a bit higher and if it's only a little bit of media, like, I don't know, a radio station in Coventry, then you might think that might be less than a global TV ad or a global um, online campaign. 
There's a secret word called MFN. It's a very useful word. I'm not going to go into it, but just bear that most favoured nations word in mind. It basically means that you can, uh, that whoever charges the highest fee between those two sides that I mentioned earlier, that fee applies to all. So if you've written a song, um, it's probably uh, very wise to say the MFN recording if you don't own the recording rights. But if you own the recording rights and it's the cover, if you say MFN with publishing, then if the publisher charges a higher fee, then you'll get the higher fee. This can be heavily regulated, but it's a little secret, little secret tip from the world of sync there. And then the money, where does the money go? So I've put here where the money normally goes in a record, record deal or a publishing sync deal. Now, if you're not on a record label and you're not on a publishing company and you own the sound recording and you own your publishing, then you get 100% of the synchronization fee for the master recording and you get 100% of the synchronization fee for the publishing. But bear in mind that Ideally, if you have a record label or a publishing company, they will help you get synced. I would say that at Domino, we're very fair and um, the majority of the money that we, that we earn as a publisher goes back to the artist. And then any money that we profit goes back into investing in uh, making brand new music. So the fourth step is processing request. That's usually going to the artist and um, seeking permission. And you can, uh, you can basically um, ignore this bit because if you are the artist, then you don't need to ask yourself permission. But just keep in mind that um, commercial music licensing is a conversation. It's about relationships. And you may want to go and seek some advice from a lawyer and um, do look at the Guild of Music Supervisors if you need to get a representative. Um, there's a few uh, music supervisors that actually specialise in exclusively representing people. And then the final step, getting paid, most important thing, the invoice. Make sure that you're set up to do invoices. Um, the AIM uh, sync uh if you join aim they have some uh, sync templates that you can use um at domino we do the paperwork for the artists we do the invoicing and then we get we pay uh during our royalty runs subject to um recruitment um recruitment is basically any uh cost that we um incur uh that that is offset against your sync fee but otherwise um make sure that your clued up at e-signatures, signing contracts, get yourself a music lawyer. Um, and, uh, you know, there's just so much help and advice online now about sync. Um, as I say, head over to the AIM uh, website and, and maybe join them. They've got tons and tons of information. Um, so that's the five steps. So hopefully I've touched upon uh, the digital aspects of sync, giving you an overview of who I am. I've hopefully targeted the freelance audience. I've told you how production works. I've given you some technical advice. Um, it is complex and could talk about this for days. Um, but I would like to talk about the future. So where are we heading? Um, head over to my LinkedIn. I've written loads of articles. Um, some of the things that concern me are the, the way that songs are tagged in search. So how, how searchable your music is on Spotify could affect a music supervisor or production company finding you. Um, so how we can scrutinize uh, the algorithm technology behind music search could really affect your career. Um, so there's lots of articles, information, anything I learn, I try and put in my LinkedIn articles and I'm, I'm trying to share other interesting things that people mention about the future and where we're heading with sync. So at the moment, I'm really excited about VR, AR, metaverses involving fashion, online fashion content, and um, trying to see what we can do to uh, 
uh, make music licensing way more accessible and a lot more fun for producers and directors and editors to get hold of our music. The other thing that's really uh, exciting is the potential that you as a music rights holder yourself uh, can just go on LinkedIn and you can just go and see who's editing shows. Another fantastic site is the, in, uh, the IMDB site, head over there, go and look up your favorite TV show, have a look at the cast and crew, see who the music supervisor is, drop them a line through LinkedIn and you never know, they might get back to you. So I'm gonna stop there and hopefully some people might have some questions uh, or Laura might reappear. And um, I'm more than happy for anyone to contact me on the LinkedIn if they've got any questions, I'm more than happy to help. And hopefully that's been helpful for you all. That's been absolutely brilliant, Lyndon. I can't thank you enough. Um, I mean, I know some of this stuff and yet that's the most clear and informative approach to uh, breaking it down and breaking down the nuances of the, the two sides from your point of view, let alone kind of like the complexities of the two different partners, the uh, my most favoured nations, the equality that actually is standard agreement in there. Um, I didn't know about the difference of... Um, PPR versus PRS and also the mechanical publishing societies, uh, the, the MP. So yeah, PPL. Yeah, thank recordings, you. Recordings. Thanks. PRS, publishing, but MCPS is the, the hidden one. That's the sneaky one. Yeah. That it's really, it's a little bit fiddly, but PPL is free to join. PRS has a small admin fee. MCPS is a little bit more tricky, but it's just just make sure you get it done. If you're serious about this, make sure you get it done because that will you really rise to the top. That's the real the real like that will really set you ahead of the game. And yeah. so many songs get stripped out because they're not registered. So what I'm talking about here is BBC, Sky, uh, ITV, the Channel Four, the main broadcasters in the UK. Um, there are different setups and different collection societies in every country. So I haven't even touched on the US of A, where all of those amazing sexy Netflix shows originate that everyone wants to be in. But the principles still apply. And um, if you're based in the UK, the PRS um, has discussions. These collection societies talk to the world. So they talk to other collection societies. Yeah around the world and they're overseen by an organization called CZAC and there is a sort of synergy there are, they do try and work with each other so if you're on PRS it's a really great it's well when you work with it every day you might have a couple of grumbles but it is actually a fantastic resource for music supervisors they rely on it really heavily and that MCPS registration that goes into the PRS one as well so it's quite often overlooked so that's my secret top tip today yeah, which isn't that's actually an amazing a secret, but it's amazing. very easily underestimated and overlooked so if you want to get in a tv show in the uk with a major broadcaster they'll find you on spotify they'll be able to contact you through your socials but if you're not on mcps that could be end of the game so make sure you get that sorted out and you and don't need a publisher a publisher will do that for you but you don't need a publisher to do that and um, PPL you just need to set up your own ISRC with PPL and their website is awesome I had a look at it free to join and you just need to to set up your own ISRC that they give you like a three digit number that you can get and so when you're putting things into Spotify if you're using an aggregator like CD Baby or whoever it might be they'll help you with that ISRC and that is the that's the key to getting stuff on the telly in the UK and that's really good. And I think there's something uh, here which has got me thinking about, about some of the artists that we're working with who we're really excited about and who we know are just about to go massive. Like they've, they're just, their sound is something really different and really exciting. And, um, but they're within like a year and a half of their careers really starting to kind of hit the ground. And I think often at that time, when you've been making work for yourself, that's the time you're least confident in your rights or how you register stuff or taking ownership of what you've already written and I think there's something really interesting in all of this which is that 
um, if you get into these habits of understanding the language, of taking ownership of what you're already doing, even your really early stuff, of registering it, of making yourself visible, you're creating a, um, a thoroughness to your craft and your understanding of all of this so that as you go forward, you're able to make the most out of who you are and what you're becoming in the same way as you're building your um your facebook live um streams or the same way as you're trying to build up your socials followings you know it's it's thinking ahead on all of that or if you're going to start putting your music on tiktok and things like that and i think it's um it's uh really really great to hear about this in this detail from you lyndon it's super useful um we have got a really good question that has come in uh on one of the buttons yes um which is a really lovely one actually which is what's been your proudest moment when an artist you represented has had their work licensed oh every single every single license is a proud moment to be honest it's very difficult i mean you kind of assume that oh she's had a sink she's been doing this forever actually every single sink is a little struggle we we struggle as much as you do we care as much as you do um, maybe not as much but we try and um, uh, so specifically I, I was going to show you this this film at the end um, and maybe I could show you it now I am really proud of this so I'm gonna I'm, shall I jump over on to share screen and I'm yes, gonna please I want to hear I want to see this uh... trying to predict the future is a discouraging and hazardous occupation. If by some miracle, a prophet could describe the future exactly as it was going to take place, his predictions would sound so absurd, so far-fetched, that everybody would laugh into scorn. Only if what I tell you appears absolutely unbelievable, there be any chance of visualizing the future as it really will happen. The only thing we can be sure of about the future is that it will be absolutely fantastic. So when I left EMI, um, I I just got, I just literally applied for my job at Domino. Well, there wasn't anything weird. I didn't know anyone at Domino already. I, um, I was 28 when I applied for my job at Domino. Um, I'd just licensed my first big sink, which was um, Simone White onto a um, uh, Audi commercial, which was directed by Michelle Gondry. It was a song called the Beep Beep Song. It was, I pitched it to, four different music supervisors and then the music supervisor I licensed it with wasn't the music supervisor who said that they got it It was very weird but anyway my eyes I just opened my I understood sync at that point I was like right this is quite a competitive game and all the music supervisors are competing with each other um I then uh was working with Coldplay this is a short story I'm gonna try and keep it short no, no, I, was working, I was working with Coldplay at the time and um they they were doing this this movie with a music supervisor called Lowell Hammond, Vertigo Films. Um, they were working with John Hopkins. They co they did a lot of co-writing with each other. John um, has a song called, uh, oh my God, I've already forgotten the name of the song. He has a song with them. And uh, he was touring with them and stuff. And um, Vertigo Films, just as I moved from Domino, uh, from EMI Records, which I was very proud to work at, to Domino, records um I kind it was almost like I was working with Vertigo and Coldplay and there was a sort of hidden John Hopkins thing and then when I moved into Domino there was a film uh, called Monsters and Vertigo Films we worked on we worked on Monsters with Vertigo Films and that was scored by John Hopkins that was kind of my first score at Domino Records so it was almost like um there's lots of weird synergy so Simone White was published by Domino Publishing and um, so that that particular it was a really big deal for me doing that sync that particular sync sort of brought together EMI and Domino Publishing and then I started working on Monsters with John Hopkins 
and then I've seen sync go from amazing to rubbish I've had I had like two years where I just I couldn't get anything and I was getting really I got very depressed actually I took it out on myself last year we've all had the most up and down year of our lives right and then I just couldn't seem to get anything for John Hopkins I couldn't understand what had happened so I'd gone from like you know monsters I got an Audi ad for John then nothing I just couldn't get anything and I was getting really stressed anyway I thought wouldn't it be amazing if you could be the theme tune like so when you think of the chain and Formula One yeah. wouldn't it be amazing if we could just totally take over advert anything about sustainability electric cars the future change like what if we just focused on that kind of business and we don't worry so much about all the other superfluous stuff I mean I happily have conversations about washing up liquid and you know other you know fast moving consumer goods but really we wanted to like how could we be like the theme tune of Formula E which would be the sustainable electric version of formula one how could we be fleetwood mac anyway we did the most complicated deal to try and lock that song in and then finally i got singularity into formula e i spoke to the um, production company the producer at the production company at the ad agency uncommon that was a conversation that went back to when he was in a different ad agency and it's such a long tail and when that ad came out last week I suddenly could understand that you're you there are peaks and troughs with sync and my boss told me this when I first started um, doing sync in 2005 so I first started licensing 2003 2003 my boss said to me beware with music licensing it's peaks and troughs peaks and troughs but I tell you right the relationships that I built in 2005 2007 2008 2009 They've all come back. They've all come back in 2021. And that is why I'm so proud because it's like, if you can maintain those conversations with people and you can maintain that focus on these artists, it's, you just get the most tremendous results and just so focused on trying to keep that determination. And it's really hard, but it's a long game, but it is like, you can get the most beautiful results. So there you go, quite a long answer there. That's a beautiful answer. And it was a great question to get us to have such a brilliant story. And I think there's a really key thing in there, which actually, to me, what one of the things I was really hearing there was actually honouring the relationships you make with people and the connections. And when when a connection or a work relationship feels strong, yeah, I've got I've got some people who I'm talking to now who, because of my career had moved in different directions, I hadn't spoken to for 10 years. And yet the synergy and the honesty and the relevance of those relationships has come back round again. And so we're now talking about new and uh, new partnerships with the Barbican as a consequence. And I think there is something sometimes that we forget that especially when everything feels very, very much like you have to keep rushing and keep running forward, that sometimes actually what you have to do is just actually stay open and wide and where those bonds are good, not force them and allow them to come true in their own, in their own timeline. And that's scary because there's no return. There's no uh, reward for that. And this year we know is tricky about all of our normal rewards and uh, wins, but I think that's a, that's really quite extraordinary. And also for Formula E. And this, this is a really interesting thing because you've mentioned twice now, and I'm going to pick the up, up on this, about your interest in, um, in uh, looking at how the, the, the sync deals that you're lining up are with ethical or forward thinking or um, green companies. And is that, and that's a really interesting shift. Is that coming out of policies within Domino? Is that coming through from the artists or is this coming from Lyndon directly? Uh, Lyndon directly. No, it's coming from our artists. It's also yeah. a value proposition. So we, we sell credibility. We sell authenticity. I, I, would, I would say that 99% of the artists on my roster do not they would rather say no to certain things they would rather have their music so they're very aware of their value their value that their music is associated with they, this thing so there's countless examples of so it's, it's such an enigma sync it's just it, it um co contradicts itself all the time 
but there are so many examples of songs that get reused over and over again and doesn't seem to affect anyone but for our artists it's like every placement they scrutinize every placement and I feel like we've got a responsibility to go and find those opportunities that sit really well with their ideology and so it may be that we're not getting hundreds and hundreds of things it might not be that there's a huge turnover but the, the quality of what we're doing and the value like the fees that we're getting um it, there needs to be a sort of uh it, it's like you're constantly there's a constant bargaining power you're constantly weighing up things but there's like a huge appetite for our artists to be associated with um brands and campaigns that they feel fit with their ideology and I think that's really exciting and I think that sets their value at a certain level so um there's even really super exciting is this uh, uh, there's like a reawakening within the scientific and medical community of the effect of music on wellness and mm. I'm absolutely um you know I'm like fixated on the the medicinal properties of music and how I don't feel like I could have survived um, most of the, the, the most challenging parts of my life without music. Like music is so important to me. Um, and like for me, music is a cast member. It's like a location. It's as important. And, um, and so I, I do feel like it's important that we have selection, that we do make choices about where the music is placed and that, you know that you are careful about about where it's used so I think you know there's one way of looking at it nowadays you can skip through ads really easily on the television like you can avoid them there's ad blockers you don't have to watch ads but when you're on Instagram and when you're on YouTube there's a lot of content and like some of that content is is misinformed and so I think we have a bigger challenge to police that and to make sure that when we are doing a legitimate license, that it's something that our artists have scrutinized, that their integrity is intact, that, you know, even if it's one second, we're in a like six second to 20 second content world now. And so if there's a 20 second Instagram piece and it's got five seconds of your music, um, you know, that could that could really screw up an artist if it if it messes with their politics or if it aligns them in a way or implies that they endorse something that they don't believe in. Which is the classic situation that we saw the last couple of years with the blanket PRS licenses and the stadiums in the US and the Trump rallies and a large number of artists being, I, I would never have my music associated with that rally. So the blanket agreements, generally speaking, will always exclude certain usages, which in oh. usually includes politics. Well, that's my thought, definitely. And in the UK, um, but anything controversial, so anything involving sexual violence yeah. um, and politics. And we have, I've had, uh, I mean, I'm not going to say that this is something that's available to all, but I have had situations where artists have been really upset by the placement of music under the blanket agreements. Mm. And thankfully we've known the right people to speak to and we've just ma we've managed to like negotiate that to be taken down um but generally speaking there there is a huge moral area around music licensing and you know if you're not bothered then you can join music libraries and you can um there's all sorts of different opportunities to have your music placed on anything mm -hmm. but the majority of artists that I've encountered in my career haven't wanted that. They've wanted income, so they want their music to be valued at a certain level. And they've also wanted um, the content that they're associated with to be, to have a strong creative merit. So it could be violent, it could be, but they want the quality of that to be within their, um, you know, their level of acceptability. And, you know, so there's, there's quite a lot of situations we encounter with, um, artists that have sadly passed and they're not around and you know I feel like we've got a strong responsibility to they're not here to say I don't want my music on that um so we have a responsibility to respect that and the worst advert I did was uh, um putting Edith Piaf on a Specsavers commercial and I was under quite a lot of pressure at the time to hit our monthly target and 
I got permission from the estate and basically the lawyers that looked after the estate said yes so I went ahead and then a guy that I really respected who worked at um, EMI at the time and he was he'd been in the music industry since the 60s and was probably best buddies with Led Zeppelin and Jimi Hendrix he turned up at my desk and ripped my he literally ripped me to shreds about how could I have done this and um, I actually ended up meeting the guy that makes all the spec savers up in fact I gave his son work experience but that's another story um I met the guy that did all the spec savers adverts and I said to him um what did we do there that wasn't he said that was probably one of the the you know biggest mistakes he'd made um basically Edith had had sight problems when she was a child and it was so inappropriate and I guess what I take from that is you know I was doing my job at the time but I choose to be at Domino I choose to work with independent music and I choose to be the person who is prepared to say no. Like I'm prepared to say no if it doesn't make sense, if it's going to have a cultural impact that's, you know, borderline reprehensible, then, you know, we are here to step in. But really we're here to provide guidance, make sure that we try and get the best deal, we try and get the best terms, we try and be part of an informed choice and I think that's it it's like for me all of the issues that we're facing culturally at the moment are around choice and every musician has the choice about whether their music is used or not and that choice might have a fee attached but that choice might have some questions in order to get to the end of that choice and make that decision you're entitled to ask questions you're entitled to ask for money um you know the scale of that and the effectiveness of your negotiation is really down to you and the people that you've got to help you um, and I'm aware that that can put people at a disadvantage but there's so much information now that if you just take each thing one step at a time think it through logically just make sheet. I used to make cheat sheets all the time so when I'm on email and now we're on zoom or I'm on phone because we use the phone a lot because it's a lot quicker I'd have a cheat sheet and it would just be all the questions I need to ask because I forget and I panic and I'm a militant, militant about templates. So my team have to use templates all the time because clients like to push you. Everything's really fast and you forget, Oh God, I've completely forgot to ask what the budget was. Um, just, just when you've got time and you've got the mental capacity to do it, don't overwhelm yourself. Just make a cheat sheet. Every time you make a mistake, you've learned something so basically I don't know 18 years of sync is just 18 years of making mistakes and then trying to be better that's all it is there's a great thing about um agency pitch decks that page seven is your ask of how much it will cost how much do you want to be involved in and you know and building the confidence to be able to talk about money and your value and so you understand the, as you were talking about, the regions and the specificity and having a clarity of your own communication and those cheat sheet questions. I do the same. I do the same when I'm doing commissioning briefs of people and when you're trying to figure out what they really want from that brief before we before, before making them work and things like that. And it's they're the best tools ever because you can just refer to it. You can literally like it, it weirdly, if it's written down, you're allowed to ask it. It's uh, there is there's permissions in all of those even if you make an, an um a fake external manager my manager has asked me to ask these questions your manager yeah, I mean I do, I do it I use the I've got like a negotiation uh cheat sheet of like yeah. uh, tactics and it's like you know fake the fake the boss so it's like oh I don't know if my boss will like that so you can you can be like oh I'm not sure if my lawyer will agree to that fee and they go a lawyer Mm, okay we're gonna have to take this person a bit more seriously yeah. you might not have hired them yet but you're entitled to ask to get a legal representation if you're signing uh signing an agreement and um, the other thing that i didn't mention was exclusivity um so yeah. chucking the word non-exclusive background usage into a uh, conversation can really save your bacon so no one is assigning rights they're not taking your copyright they're just getting a non-exclusive license, which purely means they can use it in their content, not in anything else. So they can't put it on a soundtrack. They can't like take any of your copyright. 
you shouldn't be giving your copyright to anyone unless they're paying you and a lawyer has uh, negotiated that with you. You shouldn't be signing anything. If you don't understand it, take your time. First question you should ask is, what's your deadline? So you know what the time frame is. And then just use that time. If they've got three days, use those three days. Go and um, look online. Take your time. Don't rush into it. You don't, you know, don't feel, because there's a lot of excitement. You go, oh, my God, oh, my God, the director's speaking to me. Yes, I really want to do this. Well, that's fine, but you don't need to say that quite so quickly. Like, double check you own the song, because maybe you've done a cover. Like, you know, find out a few things, just like, oh, who else is in the film? Like, what other music's in the film? Yeah. And then, you know, if you find out that everything in the film is like, you know, the Beatles or something, you think, oh, they must have budget. You know, if everything else in the film is an unsigned band, then they're obviously at it. They're trying to get like bands that are cheap. You know, when they use words like unsigned, um, uh, emerging, developing, I mean, what does that mean? Because it's there's no level of success. There's no, there is no trajectory. Like, you could be a band that's played thousand capacity, like 100 to 1,000 capacity venues for 20 years. Yeah. Um, are you successful? Are you emerging? I mean, it's ridiculous. It's all ridiculous. It's just, an, it's just a mechanic for them to imply that they don't want to spend any money. So, you know, as I said earlier, like, just think about it. If, if they've got a contract at the end of this that needs signing, how much does a lawyer cost? That's your base cost. Yeah, and if you great. don't have a lawyer, then that's fine. But you know, if you do have a lawyer, I mean, I see some artists, oh god, getting lawyers involved in the most basic sync um, agreements, and I just think that's where all your money's gone. But maybe you don't want the money. Maybe the money isn't of any interest to you. But think about it because it's an ecosystem, yeah. and if you don't value yourself, then it's like RuPaul. If you don't love yourself, how are you ever going to love anyone else? If you don't value yourself, um, why should anyone else value anything? So quite often we've had problems with um, students doing free work for a charity or a, um, like a, a brand, like a fashion brand. They've hired a student filmmaker and the student contacts us and goes, oh, everyone else is doing it for free. And I'm like, well, that's great. And that's their decision. But I, we're a commercial company. And unless it's a really good thing that our artist has made the choice with all of the information that we present, it's not their decision to decide that our music has no value. Like if the musicians themselves don't value their music, we're screwed. So it starts with the rights holders. It starts with the musicians valuing themselves. As I said, you know, it could just be 50 quid, could be yeah. 100 pounds, but something, it has to be, there has to be something on there. So, you know, just think about it. Like, you know, there's admin fees for anything that you do these days, you know, like using PayPal, using eBay, like value yourself. It's so yeah. important. And I've certainly, you know, and I've negotiated um, music for trailers for, uh, because I've known the band, but it's been negotiated through their label for a nominal fee. Oh yeah, that's my favorite word. Yeah, I forgot about nominal fee. <laughs> but, but a nominal, but I've paid a fee. Yeah. And we've done all the paperwork and it's properly licensed. And there is an, because actually, even though there wasn't a huge budget, it was important from my point of view because it, because of the music and the track and, you know, to, to make that work and to find at least some money. And so there is always, you know, if anyone hasn't put a contingency in their budget, but, and hasn't budgeted for music, then they're off their rocker. There is always, there is always money. Um, and if they say there isn't, then as, as Lyndon said, they will have to go and commission something else or pay for access for a library, which is 150 pounds a year. So that's, you know, there's all of this. Um, uh, so yeah, value yourself. Um, Oh, you were you about to come back in with something just then? Yeah, I'm trying to stop myself because I could talk for hours. So I'm literally, I'm literally biting my tongue. I, well, all I was going to say is the lessons of commercial licensing are the lessons for any commercial negotiation that you ever do. So the, the sort of steps that we've gone through today are the same for negotiating anything. Yes. And effectively, you just need an agreement in an email and then an invoice gets paid. That is the consideration. That's the thing that 
locks off like you have an agreement you get paid that is a contract however always 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 really important to get a signed contract because basically that's both parties actively showing that they've read the terms and that they both agree and that's really all a lawyer's doing is just making sure that everything is in a readable format that both parties sign so it just proves both parties saw these terms and then get that invoice paid most importantly and look at the, t- the templates that are on the um a aims a aim uh independent uh, uh <laughs> The Association of Independent Musicians. There we go. Thanks. I'll get there. It's the end of the day. Um, and on PRS, they have licensing templates. They have to read that documentation, figure out what words you don't understand, Google them, watch a couple of other webinars, come back to this one, rewatch it, go, oh, that's that word there. And the that's the agency that Laura keeps misnaming. Um, uh, and figure all those things out. Um, there are often, you often find that there are lawyers who are associated with a lot of these organizations and they will sometimes once or twice a year they'll do surgeries which are basically um half hour informal advice sessions i've used those before for my event company when i've wanted to talk through transferring my ip for all of my events on my sole trader to my limited company it turns out i had to draw up an entire licensing documentation to to transfer it from myself to myself um and all the documentation of everything we'd made in the previous 10 years there's but the, all this is really good stuff and that was a half hour conversation they went ah okay i know all the legwork i need to do and then it's going to go to cost me the nominal paperwork amounts to get this over the line. And so there's lots of things you can do for that, which will leave you in a really empowered position. Um, and that's the trick is to know that you have the right to empower yourself, learn these things, stand your ground, ask the questions, everything that Lyndon was saying, register your music because your music has value to you. Therefore register it. Um, and maybe nothing will come of it for four or five years, but maybe that, um, really surreal uh i don't know art house japanese influenced electronica track made with um half a drain pipe and a carpet uh and a synthesizer is like the thing that a sci-fi filmmaker has been trying to find has never heard anyone make yeah you don't know there's Uh, a home for everything got to sow these seeds and let them go and Some people get lucky and they churn it out and it's a factory, but for other people, it might be something that you put out 10 years ago that you've forgotten about Mm -hmm. and it gets discovered. And because they can find your song on Spotify, because it's quite often it's because the song title is what they're looking for. The the word, they're looking for the word freedom and the song has freedom in the title. I mean, that's pathetic, but that is really what happens. So I think someone licensed a song that had spider in the title from me once because they had an advert with a spider in it and I just thought wow that's the power of YouTube because they found it on YouTube but they can find us and that's the point if you're searchable they can find you make sure you know your rights you've got your cheat sheets you know uh where your instrumental files are be in control of tidying up your recording master recordings get those stems in a really nice tidy format I'm obsessed with stems now because of um, progress with Dolby Atmos and immersive sound. So make sure you have your stems, get them off the studio. If you're using a studio, keep those stems. They're your, they're going to be your golden goose in the future. So um, yeah, yeah, be just, just be aware. Don't be overwhelmed. Just be aware. Yeah. Perfect. Um, I'm going to say that this won't be the last uh, um, that we get to work with, hopefully, the wonderful Lyndon, because I am uh, working furiously um, to get her and her wisdom (laughs) and all of her joy uh, down to Plymouth to work on a couple of projects, uh, which we're both very, very excited about. Um, And so you'll be hearing a lot more from both of us, um, hopefully more from her than me, because uh, she's (laughs) very, very knowledgeable and we like her. Um, And... uh, um, you can watch this back and recheck all this information. Do find Lyndon on her um, LinkedIn account. Uh, do check out what Domino's Records and Domino's Publishing are doing because they are awesome. Um, go check out the um, performers associations that um, and royalty associations and rights associations that Lyndon has mentioned. Um, and 
uh, yeah, come and get involved with Rebels Music, come work with the producers we've got who can teach you more about how to, uh, to think about this, to write your tracks, get involved. We can't wait to have you um, in the building and hopefully, yeah, next time we'll be able to uh, be uh, doing this face-to-face -face with uh, Lyndon and making really good stuff happen. Thank you so much, Lyndon, because that was an incredibly informative and absolutely brilliant masterclass. So um, I feel very blessed that we had uh, uh, your wisdom this evening. Um, and thank you for everyone who is uh, listening in and will be watching this again um, after the fact. Um, we look forward to seeing you next week. Ta -ra. Thank you.